Hi Courtney, Miko, tell us where we are. We're at Henson Studios, which actually used to be A&M, which actually used to be United Artists, which was built by my great half or full uncle, Douglas, son of Ezekiel Ullman Fairbanks, and Mary Pickford and uh, Charlie Chaplin. And it was the first, this was the first studio that artists owned. And it completely, completely went to fucking hell. And then it was A&M forever and ever. And now it's Henson and they have Kermit outside. Like they're kind of trying to turn Kermit, the Henson family is trying to turn Kermit into sort of a Mickey figure. But inside here, the album is almost done. Ish. I mean, that shouldn't say Courtney Love. It should say, it should say whole, um, because it's saying whole record. And Melissa's going to be here in a few days. If we remember Melissa of tomorrow. Um, and, um, Melissa is going to sing, and then we have some cello coming, either, um, there's a, um, a, a quartet of cellists called Apocalyptica that I really love, and then there's, um, uh, this guy that played on Unplugged, Eric, and he plays, it's, it's very ocean rainy, whatever, but the record's gone from being, um, uh, you know, an aspiration of blood on the tracks to, then I heard Diamond Dogs recently, and I was like, I mean, the guitar wasn't as fat and fabulous, but, and the guitar, and the drums weren't, I mean, this is, it's huge. It's like a big fixed shape hole. And, um, getting through this last business of it is, is really hard because I, I, there's no guide vocals on this record. This is the first record, I think, in the history of time with no guide vocals on it. It's pretty weird. Yeah, it's weird. You know it was weird, though? We got to hear, um, we got to hear isolated guitar off XL of Main Street the other night. It was like being in the fucking Vatican. It was so insane. Like Don, went, the, um, the producer who's doing all these outtakes from Exile, like turned up Keith's guitar in 1970 and Elko, like, and you hear this like just sort of, eh, eh, and then you hear him, it's awesome. It's like being, it was, it was religious. <laughs> We've heard some stuff tonight, and the rock Courtney is back. The, well, the rock Courtney didn't really go away, um, but I needed a rock. I needed a rock partner, so I have my rock partner now. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, you know it. So um, um, I am old enough to be his cool auntie, but um, that's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you said. You said to me about him before. But about this one. Mm. Um, well, there's these old roadies around sometimes, you know, they, 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 ne they never say nothing. And, uh, um, you know, they're very, very quiet. And when they do speak, you, you kind of listen. Because it's very, you know, just like the film community is a very small community. And, you know, I once threw um, a monitor, uh, uh, the monitor guy for Madonna, I threw a shoe at him. And, uh, oh, God, did that bite me on the ass. So, you you know, you got to behave because you won't get the A-list a a crew and whatnot. Anyway... Um, on, on two occasions now, one occasion was unsolicited, one occasion was, uh, I said, so what do you think of Mako? Um, to one guy who speaks about three times a year, he goes, best guitar player I've ever heard. I'm like, yeah, but you know, remembering Saxondale, nothing to do with the person who plays Saxondale, Saxondale, but remembering Saxondale and, and, and the, the torment, I watched Saxondale and the torment of Saxondale is that he never worked with Zeppelin, did he? Yeah, yeah. So I always go, did you work with Zeppelin? Um... And uh, this particular person had worked, worked with the firm, uh, which is, you know, Paige. And, and I said, so, so compare it to, you know, the, as good as Paige now. Yeah. I mean, to me, that was as good a fucking a compliment as you could dream of. Nobody will ever be as good as Paige then. So then um, uh, another guy um, who actually I've only heard speak once. He works for us, probably. And I said, um, what do you think? And he said, best guitar player ever. What the fuck is it with you? I don't know. Um, Did you get, it, I'm reading this book called Outliers, and it talks about the 10,000 hour rule, and, you know, why the Beatles got so good. And this was, was, was with Pete Best, but that, that it was like this random series of events where a guy from the red light district uh, in Hamburg, you know, rock and roll was still until until Brian Epstein. We were well. 
I'm still treated like Mike Tyson meets a porn star or something um, when it comes to my financial life. But, you know, the rest of my life is pretty damn fun. Um, but, uh, you know, carnies. We were treated a lot like carnies. And so to put a rock band in the red light district in Hamburg was a good idea. And the guy just happened to run into a scouser. And so he started sending him Liver Pudley and bands. The Beatles would play eight hours a fucking night. So he's been playing since he was four. And, you know, um, uh, Corgan came in here the other night. And, and you know, the, the awesomeness of, of Billy's talent is amazing. The fact that he hasn't been able to apply it to himself. You know, Samantha, which you just heard, that he wrote that riff. You know, I mean, we, we arranged it. We made it, like, a lot better. But I think if you had, I don't know if you listened to it two and a half years ago, but the reason that I went to the UK was because, um, uh, you raise them in a different way. You raise them not to think about money before they strike a fucking string. And the minute you think about money before you strike a, look, the money will come. The money will go. <laughs> the money will come. You know what I mean? Like, if you just, like, sort of let it go and, and, oh, my publishing, I mean, one person wrote a song and it may or may not make it, but, uh, I heard that he said, this is my one chance. I was like, oh, God, this is so L.A. You know, and, and it just there's, there's a real lack of corruption in, 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 in the U.K. Although, you know, you do teach your bands to slam each other. And what's weird is that, like, you know, Russell Brand can do all right over here and be obnoxious. And I think if Noel got his shit together and Fielding, he could do all right over here and throw TVs out a window. But, but Chris Martin has to be really polite to everybody. So, you know, the archetype British... You know, motherfucker. I think he's on his seventh crazy girl. Something like that. Yeah, well, I used to walk across the bloody street. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't put strip clubs next to recording studios. Well, particularly, you know, ones that... When I first saw crazy girls, I thought it said crazy girl. Because that used to be a cafe. Yeah. I was like, oh, I have to work there. It's crazy girl. But then the plural kind of ruined it. Plus, there's alcohol. So I worked around the corner in the day, and at the Seventh Vale, same family, Charlie, they're all fucking named Charlie, and um, I will tell you something, let me ask you this, when they strip over there, because I haven't been there for a while, is it still pour some sugar on me, that's the money maker, um, or do they dance to alternative now? It, it's kind of varied, they they play a lot of, because um, like, those girls have black hair and tats, right? Yeah, but there's also the R&B girls as well, so it's either kind of Nine Inch tips. Nails, Marilyn Manson, or... Yeah, but it, you, you're not making lots of money there, you know, no. you want to get your 20s, because, I mean, the whole, the whole Dita thing is like that it's the journey, not the destination, I think stripping should be the destination. <laughs> It's just me. I mean, we. You know, when I when I was in England that time, like two years ago, I was not leaving without a full band. And um, Willie Burrell and Noel could not stand this one girl. And I thought, oh, they can't stand her. She'll go down great. She'll go down a tree. And stay. <laughs> she didn't. She's really nice. But she just didn't fit in. Um, at all. And uh, no, I liked her. I don't want to say her name. Um, but um, uh, I thought, well, if these Londoners can't stand her in Arkansas, they'll love her. And um, why did I bring that up? Oh, because she'd stripped and she started on that empowerment shit. I'm like, fuck off. Fucking do it for the fucking money to get your fucking van. And you have to give it, you know, Mikey said to give it to Grumpy Eric and he put it in a bank account and then we had a van and then we could tour. So, you know, I just didn't buy costumes and shit. And I never tried to dance to like Jane says or something. It didn't make any money. So over there they do, now it's 2009. Look. I'm a little out of it. Okay, I stripped for the 80s. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm old. But um, but I still, you know, once you've been a stripper, it's Tuesday, you pass by the veil, you think, I can make 300 bucks. Damn it, should I? Like, there's a party. It's always going to be there. But um, but I wonder what, I never had to strip in, like, Liverpool or something, but do they have strip clubs in Liverpool? Yeah. They I, do. I think the weirdest strip club I ever went to was in Glasgow. No, it was in Edinburgh. In Scotland. What? what? Was it like chicks with one arm? Oh, shit? dude, it was weird. I'm like what? <laughs> These birds were ropey. <laughs> Have you been to Cheetahs? Uh, no. Okay, Cheetahs is like, it's like a lot of unattractive women. I mean, Jumbos <laughs> is like... Oh, that, I have been to the Jumbos. Fucking, fucking, this is the thing. I put Jumbos on the goddamn map and I'm sick of not... It's like Portland. You know, give me my credit. 